presenting uh, the part of pathophysiology of chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. And my uh, co um, speaker, Ms. Madiha, will present the pharmacological part of uh, the medicines uh, which are causing chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting and their management. So, uh, as we all know, uh, the nausea is uh, the subjective sensation or feeling of unsettled stomach. And next slide, huh? uh, it is associated with sensation uh, that the vomiting is impending. And it's, it's a very bad uh, feeling uh, if you have experienced this. And the vomiting is the physical expulsion of the stomach content via the mouth. So, uh, what is a chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting? Uh, the nausea and vomiting, which is provoked or induced by any anti cancer agent, is called chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. Next slide. So, uh, what is the pathophysiology of nausea and vomiting? Basically, uh, next slide. Please proceed to the next slide. Yes, so uh, this is a very good diag diagrammatic presentation, uh, which is showing uh, the mechanism of uh, any sort of nausea and vomiting which any person experienced in the life. Uh, the main part of this uh, nausea vomiting uh, is the uh, vomiting center, which is situated in medulla oblongata brainstem, uh, from where the signals pass to the nucleus of solitary tract in the brain. Uh, this is the main site from where the vomiting is generated and it received many uh, of the signals from different parts of our body such as uh, because of motion sickness vestibular stimulation occur vestibular stimulation result in activation of vestibular cerebellum and then this gives signals to the nucleus of solitary tract the other mechanism could be uh, uh, sense of taste or sense of smell uh, or any uh, sense of pain which can lead to activation of uh, cerebral cortex, amygdala or limbic system, which in uh, later on sends signal to the nucleus of solitary tract. Uh, another mechanism could be uh, through the chemotherapy agents or toxic toxins produced by microbial agents which result in activation of area posterima, which send signal to the nucleus of solitary tract. Uh, another mechanism could be via the gastric ischemia or gastric distension or any uh, kidney disease or something other, which leads to activation of vagal efferent pathway. Uh, this gives sensory uh, feeling to the nucleus of solitary tract or uh, the last but not the least, uh, chemotherapeutic agents, toxins, or infections can lead to activation of enterochromaffin cells in the GIT tract. All of these pathways give signal to the nucleus of solitary tract, which in turn leads to activation of dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. And this nucleus result in a uh, motor part of the vomiting and it result in a uh, contraction of the muscles of the throat or the diaphragm and leads to emesis. Next slide. Next slide. Please next. Yes. So, um, uh, when we talk about chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, uh, the chemotherapeutic drugs uh, in the GIT tract lead to uh, formation of uh, free radicals. These free radicals results in release of serotonin from enterochromaffin cells of GIT tract. Then the serotonin binds to 5-HT3 receptors and it leads to activation of vomiting center uh, via vagal efferent pathway uh, to the area posterima chemotherapy trigger zone or uh, nucleus of solitary tract. And then uh, these pathways 
uh, ultimately lead to activation of uh, vagal motor nucleus uh, and uh, result in emetic reflects. Next slide. In acute, uh, we can divide the uh, pathway of uh, nausea and vomiting into the peripheral and the central pathway. The peripheral pathway mainly lead to acute onset nausea and vomiting, uh, which I have told previously uh, via activation of uh, GIT enterochromaffin cells, free radical formation and serotonin formation. And the central pathway uh, results uh, when a chemotherapeutic agent uh, cause activation of a neurotransmitter release, which is called substance P from the neurons of central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. This substance P then binds to a neurokinin 1 receptor. And this receptor uh, ultimately leads to activation of the vomiting center in the medulla oblongata, chemotherapy trigger zone, or nucleus of solitary tract, which are the th three main parts of brain uh, which receive efferent uh, sensory intake uh, of vomiting pathway. And then uh, this causes the vagus efferent pathway activation and uh, emesis uh, generates. Next slide. So uh, after talking about the pathophysiology, now we will talk about the risk factors which leads to uh, nausea vomiting uh, in any patient which is receiving chemotherapy. The, these factors can be uh, divided into patient-related factors or uh, treatment-related factors. When we talk about patient-related factors, uh, patient-related factors can be age. The younger the patient, the chances are more to have uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting. Females are more prone to have uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting, if the patient has history of motion sickness or pregnancy-related nausea and vomiting, uh, they can have uh, more chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting. <laughs> Alcohol use uh, actually leads to lower risk of chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting. Uh, possibly, it causes the desensitization of chemotherapy trigger zone. Next slide. Recording in uh, progress. Slide. Recording Certain other factors uh, are also there, uh, such as if the patient has electrolyte imbalance, uh, constipation, if the patient has tumor in the GIT tract, liver or brain, uh, certain infections, kidney diseases, ascites, gastroparesis, anxiety, or certain other medicines such as opioids can lead to uh, higher chances of chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting. Uh, when we talk about treatment-related risk factors, the most important uh, uh, trigger is the emetogenic potential of a chemotherapy drug. The higher the uh, potential uh, of emetogenicity, uh, the higher will be chances of chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting. Uh, the combination agents cause more risk of chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting as compared to single agent. Chemo radiation also increases the risk of uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting, and then the duration and exposure time also leads to higher chances of chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting. Next slide. So uh, now uh, we will discuss about the classification of chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting. We can divide chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting into five subtypes, acute onset, delayed onset, refractory, anticipatory, and breakthrough. Next slide. When we say acute onset nausea vomiting, it can occur after a few minutes to several hours after administration of chemotherapy agent, and it usually resolves uh, within the first 24 hours. And uh, the peak time is usually after five to six hours. And uh, Acute onset nausea vomiting uh, is influenced by type and dosage of emetogenic agent, history of nausea and vomiting, uh, the environment in which anti-cancer agent is administered, and efficacy of anti-emetic regimen. Next. <laughs> 
the delayed onset nausea vomiting is basically the vomiting which occur after 24 hours of chemotherapy administration and it usually occur with high immunogenic chemotherapeutic agents such as cisplatin carboplatin cyclophosphamide and anthracycline and uh, uh, such as cisplatin induced emesis uh, peaks uh, at 48 to 72 hours after administration and it can last for six to seven days. Next. Uh, the anticipatory nausea and vomiting uh, is basically uh, the feeling of a patient before uh, he or she is receiving the next treatment. And when they recall the previous bad experience of nausea vomiting uh, in the previous cycle. And uh, the incidence of anticipatory chemotherapy induced nausea vomiting range from 18 to 57 percent. Mm -hmm. And usually young patients and females are more prone to have uh, anticipatory nausea vomiting. And uh, because they usually get uh, aggressive chemotherapy regimen and they have a poor emesis control than older patients. Next. The breakthrough or refractory nausea and vomiting can be classified simultaneously. Uh, the breakthrough uh, uh, chemotherapy induced nausea vomiting, it refers to uh, the vomiting that occur in patients despite prophylactic antiemetic treatment. We give uh, uh, antiemetics, but the uh, patient develop despite that uh, nausea and vomiting, and they need a, a rescue uh, antiemetic later on. And in this uh, setting, uh, we should sort out other causes of uh, nausea and vomiting as well. Next. So uh, as we discussed, uh, the breakthrough nausea and vomiting usually occur uh, within five days, despite optimal antiemetic regimen, and it requires rescue therapy with other antiemetics. While the refractory uh, nausea and vomiting is uh, that, uh, which occur despite maximum antiemetic protocol. Next slide. Uh, radiation induced nausea vomiting usually uh, occur uh, uh, and based on site of radiation. Uh, the patients who are receiving total body or upper abdominal radiation or craniospinal radiation are more prone to have nausea and vomiting as compared to other sites. Next slide. So uh, this uh, all cover uh, my part of presentation. Now there are certain myths uh, and facts uh, which usually patients ask us uh, while they receive chemotherapy such as uh, that if the patient has more uh, nausea and vomiting, this means that the chemotherapy is working. This is a myth. Uh, it, it doesn't have to do anything with the response rate of chemotherapy. It's basically the immunogenic uh, activity of a chemotherapy drug and the response uh, of uh, any chemotherapy is basically uh, assessed by uh, imaging or physical examination. Uh, then certain uh, people think that uh, the chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting is an untreatable side effect. This is not the fact. If we give a good uh, uh, anti-emetic agent, uh, anti-emetic protocol according to the chemotherapy protocol to a patient, they can uh, have a lesser degree of nausea or vomiting uh, with the same uh, chemotherapy agent. Uh, then certain uh, people think that uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting is uh, does not affect quality of life, but in fact, uh, this is the main culprit and this is the main side effect which uh, actually um, uh, have a major significant impact on the daily activities and patient uh, can become unable to perform daily activities if they have a severe nausea and vomiting feeling all uh, throughout the day. So it should need to be uh, managed. So the take home message from my presentation is to understand pathophysiology of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting is very important to select therapeutic options for, for its control. And control of nausea, nausea and vomiting is a paramount in the treatment of cancer patient because of various complications and withdrawal from useful and curative antineoplastic treatment. Thank you. This is all about my presentation. Uh, thank you so much, 